we have to solve this climate problem. We've got 20 years less if we carry on growing the amount of CO2 we're pumping into the atmosphere. And we have to make a radical change. That the, 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 what's planned today about you know, maybe getting out of the coal, oil and gas sector by 2050 is just nowhere near enough. We actually have to reduce the amount of CO2 we create by about 9% a year. And 9% a year, I mean, that's a phenomenal number. And given that, given that the amount of CO2 or emissions that we create is directly tied to the size of the economy, then without some sort of decoupling, that means reducing the size of the economy by 9% a year. I mean, it's a tremendous change. Yeah. And I don't think people understand what that requires. I mean, it, it means that we have to stop flying airplanes, that we have to get ourselves off gasoline-driven cars, that we have to make a radical transition in our energy provision, that we have to change the farming infrastructure. And we have to do all of this in a short period of time if we're to avoid disaster. So, so we need not just incremental change, we need radical change, and we need it very quickly. And we need to bring people together to make that decision in a, an astonishing short period of time. Now, I'm not saying it's going to be easy. I'm not saying that I believe it's going to happen, but I know that's what needs to happen. And my question is, how do we make it happen? How do we, I mean, this is the, we're gambling the future of civilization. Yeah, I mean, I think if I speak to Dennis Meadows, one of the other authors of Limits to Growth, I mean, he says that you need to have two conditions before you make a change. First of all, you need to understand, and then you need to care. And, and I think what's missing today is, first of all, understanding. People don't understand how serious and how urgent the problem is, and that's what I'm trying to, to do something about. And I think once you understand it, it's very difficult not to care, because when you see how, how big the implications are going to be for billions of people and for all of our children and grandchildren, then I think we, we can begin to, to, to shift the needle. But again, it comes back to to bring together the people in society who understand that and who care. It doesn't need more than 50% of the world population, but it needs a, a sufficient number of people in the rich world to push for change. And then I think we can do something, but it's certainly going to be tough. I think your synthesis right there is, is spot on, that we need a reasonable number of people in the rich world. Um, and we're not even talking about rich countries per se, but we need people who really do control the levers of society to get that no one comes out of this alive if we don't do something. So tell me again, uh, uh, again, tell me about your, your next book. The new book is basically saying, look, here's the problem. It's an existential problem. It, it affects the, the, the future existence of humanity. Second thing is, here's what's going to happen if we don't change. And that's actually remarkably easy to predict because we know what's happening to the climate. We know what's going to happen to temperatures. And we know what's going to happen to economic growth because of long-term trends. It's basically a, looking at something like, like limits to growth. If you look over a long enough period, the trends are very easy to predict, population, for example. And then how do we change it? How do we radically shift our economies? What sort of steps do we need to take? And then a, a more philosophical look at how we need to think differently if we're to get through this. But, but it also, I mean, the main part is you know, cutting it, the aviation sector, cutting the automotive sector, cutting chemicals and packaging and all of those businesses so that we can reduce the amount of energy we consume and the amount of pollution we create. And that we find a way of building a transition, uh, although it's not going to be pain free, so that we can, we can avoid this two degree uh, increase in average temperatures. Yeah. But what I really want to do is waken people up to see that it's not going to be you know, recycling glass and turning vegan that's going to save us. It's going to be something much, much bigger. Although those things will help, but no, it's going, it's, it's going to have to be uh, society changing radically, radically from the current direction, yes. Exactly. I mean, even if, even if all of China or all of Germany stops producing CO2 tomorrow, that's not enough. That's not going to save us because the rest of the world is going to carry on producing what it's doing today. We need to come together to do this and we need to find a way to cooperate. And that's going to be one of the biggest challenges. How do you see that occurring? Is it going to happen in one leading country, say China or Germany, and, and spread how do you see that unfolding? What, are, what possibly could... That's obviously the most difficult question. People need to understand first, and then we need to have this groundswell of change. I think engaging with young people in particular is going to be essential because people in their 20s and 30s are going to feel the effects of this. It will become existential for them and their children. 
I think the military can play a very big role here. Military forces around the world see the danger of climate change. They know what it means for migration. They know what it means for, for food and security. Uh, so I think they can play a very important role. Politicians right now are not paying enough attention and they need to be, we need to use the de democratic process to increase the pressure on politicians. And then there are other organizations like the Catholic Church. I mean, the Vatican came out a few years ago with Laudato Si and it speaks to billions of people around the world, and that can have a big impact as well. Uh, other social organizations, the trade union movement, the educational establishment, we need to, 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 to harness as many voices as possible to create this momentum. Uh, if we wait until it's obvious that we need to change, it's too late. So it's a question of educating uh, and, and pressing for urgent change. You know, I take very, very seriously your comments about uh, young people, they are both the most at risk and perhaps the most hip to what's going on. And I wanted half jokingly to say at the same time that you release your new book, I hope that you can release it in comic format, in graphic novel format. I'm writing it in a way which is hopefully very easy to access. And, and it's a short book. It's only 120 pages. You, be, you should be able to read it in a day. And it's written with that in mind, that it's going to be attractive to younger people. I think the idea of a cartoon book is brilliant. The Club of Rome had its first ever summer academy last year in Italy, and we brought together 100 young activists. Mm. And, and, and that was, I think, a really good way to engage, to bring them together, to, to explain to them over a week what's going on and what, what the challenge actually is, and then let them feed the message out to their networks. You know, we're, you're, we're presenting a problem which is extremely complicated and to which there is no simple solution. There is no happy ending, easy, easy answer here. And that's what makes it difficult to communicate. But certainly we have to find ways to reach as big an audience as possible. But what else can we do? I mean, we get up in the day, we have to do something, and we have to do everything we can every day to try and avoid this problem because there's nothing else to do. Oh,